Welcome, welcome back to the blue stage. We are going to resume with our agenda right now. We're going to have a panel, which will be a live recording of Algorithm podcast. So for that, we have some amazing panelists. Some of them you, will, you have seen today already. So please meet the panelists. Uh, we have here today Preet Livak, Head of Engineering at Nortel. We also have Teed Panenen, VP of Engineering at Verif. We have Martin Kapp, who is Head of Engineering at Pipedrive. Uh, Dylan Beatty, Director at Ursatile, and Sven Peters, Developer Advocate at Manfred. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's just so like been on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're on air. I'll admit. <laughs> All right. You have uh, more than 2,000 people listening to you right now. Really? Yes. 2,000? Hello, everybody. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's going to be uh, next week when they listen to you, so... Hello next week, everybody. <laughs> you're, it's cool. You're We're traveling to the future. We're sending now. messages into the future. Yes. <laughs> it's a very, very relevant topic today as, as we're talking about past and the future as well. Okay, so let's go get going. Um, hello everybody and thank you for tuning in to Algorithm. <laughs> this is our 129th episode and we are recording it at an awesome Digit conference in Tartu, by the way, that's uh, unusual as well. I am Preet Livak from Nortel, and with me I have Martin Kapp from Pipedrive and Teet Panarin from Verif. Uh, last live recording that we did, it was just three of us, but uh, this time we have two amazing superstars of our industry joining us. Uh, we have Dylan Beatty and Sven Peters with us here. And if you are listening to this um, uh, audio version or watching it on video and you, you don't know who these guys are, then you haven't done your homework as an <laughs> effective uh, software developer, so go on and Google them. So welcome, Sven and Dylan. It's uh, nice you. to have you here. No pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Uh, so today we're talking about the past and future of being a developer. And I want to kick this off with uh, some of the recent events I have observed in, uh, in specifically in Java software development. Uh, a bunch of security vulnerabilities have been coming up. We've had log for shell Spring for shell We've had Oracle Java vulnerabilities recently. It kind of feels that it was much more secure to write software in the past, and, and now it's suddenly not. So what do you guys think about these things? Um, so the thing I think that often gets lost when people say, oh, you know, the old days were more secure or, you know, any kind of nostalgia. One, uh, unless it was really bad, human beings tend to remember the good stuff <laughs> because that's just, it makes you a kind of happier, more balanced individual. But also, you know, yeah, software used to be more secure because it didn't do so much. It, uh, you know, you go back far enough, you had software that wasn't connected to anything. Your computer was in your office or in your house. It didn't have a network connection. The only way to break into it was to kick in the door. So the software security wasn't a problem. And as you know, our expectations about what software should be capable of, you're like, you know, now you say, oh, I need a spreadsheet, but it's got to be a cloud spreadsheet with collaboration, single sign-on. Uh, also, it's got to do all the spreadsheet stuff, the graphs and the numbers and the addition and the compound interest, and it needs cloud sharing, it needs social networking, it needs all these features. And, and so the, just the surface area where vulnerabilities can be lurking becomes so much greater. And as a developer, you know, there's no way now anybody, I think, would reasonably set out to implement all of that from scratch, writing every line of code. We do it by, we pull in packages, and we trust cloud hosting. We use federated authentication. And uh, yeah, you know, you have more code, you'll have more bugs, more vulnerability, because that's just, I think, how it scales. Sven, what do you think? Yeah, I think also the, the surface area just got broader. Um, as you, as you said, like software were running on my machine, we should detect my machine, but now it's running in the cloud and uh, there's much more interest to just like break in one system in the cloud and get, get all the data. So our, our software get much more exposed um, these days. Um, yeah, and um, we, we, we tend to, we need to grow into this area 
Because, I mean, we have been written software for decades and didn't think about that. And now we're just like putting it out there in the cloud and surprise, surprise, there are hackers that just like somebody's, want to get, get the data. Somebody's trying to exploit it, right? Yeah, but right. I think um, knew. So, Developers were all, uh, well, uh, engineers were also a little bit behaving more nicely in the past. I remember back in 95 when I was used to work in Hansebank, uh, I actually telneted to main server of the Hansebank from my university machine. It was okay to do that. And that was completely working, and, and it, that was a sort of a normal thing to do, basically. Mm -hmm. Then a year later, we got the first firewall, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Does that also mean, like, uh, well, software development started at a more simpler place, whereas uh, we didn't have to worry about security because no one was really taking advantage of these missing security features. Well, right? if there's no business, why yeah, attack it? Yeah. Right? But now that people know about all of the value that is in the data and everything, everybody wants to suddenly get it. Hmm. So you have to start protecting it. So people and hackers get smarter as well, I guess. So we have to become smarter as developers. So it used to be like good guys in the business. Now they're yeah, all, all yeah. the guys in the business. All the guys in the business. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on, the, on the same note, uh, this, this also means that now there's security on the plate of developers as well. And over the past uh, decade, we've seen a lot of new stuff coming on that plate. We've seen infrastructure automation. Uh, we've seen the kind of front-end development as a separate discipline. Uh, we've seen a lot of new kind of ways of communication, a lot of uh, new protocols, uh, asynchronous communication becoming more and more a thing. Um, and kind of we're expecting more kind of these soft disciplines from developers as well, like team building and uh, sprint planning, something that mm -hmm. before wasn't the thing. So if this thing continues, where do developers go? It's, it, it feels like it's becoming more and more of an impossible profession to, to be in because it's so wide and so... So we ask too much? Yes. Do we ask too much? So something I've definitely observed in my own career, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, you could have a one-hour meeting on Monday morning and it would take you the rest of the week to implement what you decided. And we're talking, you know, this was before, so you wanted to get some data out of a database and put it on a web page. You wrote, put this column in that variable, this column in that variable, because we didn't have object relational mapping. There was no active record, no, uh, you know, hibernate or anything. And, you know, that was kind of, it was work you got good at doing because you did it a lot. And it was always the same with different variable names. And so the balance was a little bit of kind of planning and discussion and then quite a lot of just fairly routine, repetitive, write a query for this table and map it to this view. And then a little bit of you know, more creative programming, doing stuff you hadn't done before. And what I think has, has happened is that the bit in the middle is now automated. You know, we don't write code like that anymore. You just like, you know, connect to that table and give me the data in a data structure. Boom, there it is. It's done. And so the, the shift, it's faster now to deliver it, but also expectations. More people are involved in what your applications look like. What do they have to do? How do they behave? Um, you know, responsive design. It's got to work on mobile as well as desktop. I've got to think about security, internationalization, GDPR, all these kinds of things. And so, you know, I think that is very, very rare now for a developer just to be like, I'm going to write code and produce something that is valuable to other people. Now, the flip side to that, I think, is uh, the activity of development. You can still create something that's very valuable to you or to the people you work closely with within your own team. But there's always this tendency to, hey, this is useful. Let's sell it. And it's like, no, 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 if we sell it, we need to put security on. You know, it's like telnetting into the bank. When it's just you and people you trust and it's not kind of anything public, you're like, yeah, this is cool and it's useful. We know how it works. And you know what? If it doesn't work, we'll just do it the way we used to do it. Um, and so, you know, maybe I, uh, we do expect too much from, maybe not too much from developers, but too much from development. Um, there's not enough appreciation of just how difficult it is to really get all this stuff right. And, you know, relying, expecting one single individual to cover all of those skills is perhaps unrealistic. Um, particularly in an industry that's like, hey, you've got 12 months in a boot camp, you're a senior developer now. And it's like, well, no, where's the seniority you get after 20 years, 30 years, 40 years in the, in the industry? Because we still don't know quite what to do with those people. We turn them into managers so that they can earn lots of money. We give and them new responsibilities yeah. that they don't know how to do. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly this. Uh. <laughs> so what, what you're saying is uh, that uh, I, I know it's, it's not right to do civil engineering uh, parallels or comparisons with software engineering, but it's, if you're building a shed for yourself, then uh, you, you don't really care for the security because you maybe don't keep anything valuable there, but mm. if you're building, mm -hmm. I don't know, a bridge, then you need all those other disciplines and the actual uh, competency of uh, engineering yeah. to put it up there. Yeah, but also the role of software has actually changed. Um, I mean, how much, how much software did, did, we, did we have just like 20 years ago? And, and now this is all the software developers out there writing software. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that life was simpler in the good old days. I mean, I remember also the good old <laughs> days, but I wouldn't say like life was simpler. We had to just deal with, with other stuff. There was some memory allocation that we had to do um, and that we have to find out where, where does it go, some bit shifting around because we didn't have all these possibilities that we have now that seems like we, we're working on more complex things. Um, and I agree that it's, it's getting more, we have more disciplines now. It's not just like writing the code um, and just like see, okay, how do we, how do we, are we building our library ourselves or is there something out there? Today, everything is out there and you just like grab it and get it and put it into your software and just like make the connections um, to put it a simpler way. But it's, it's, that, that is probably getting more complicated and we have to just like cool. learn. I mean, back in the days, I was, I, was, I was actually in university learning that, yeah, if you, if you develop software, you have to do it the waterfall way, just like, writing all the specification up front and then go into your, into your box for one year or so and then present the software. This is just more agile now, that's, that's the way to do it, but there's also some, some learning curve and we will, get, we will get into this that we need some, some different disciplines and maybe we need to split up the disciplines in software development, what we already do, like, um, but then there also needs a blending um, that people, developers understand the IT technology, the security stuff. Um, but maybe we, we need to just like see that there are some kind of specialists that are just like um, with, with some overlapping um, disciplines that we have to know about. There used yeah. to be a um, wonderful observation about software, which was that you're talking about waterfall that reminded me. All software development is you write some code, then you run it, then you work out what you did wrong, and then you go and change the code. And if you do that every day, that's extreme programming. And if you do it every two weeks, that's agile. And if you do it every six months, that's waterfall. And if you do it every five years, that's oracle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and you know, if, if you're, if you're we, lucky, like um, your software gets deployed, or you, you use the software, but yeah. most of the software projects just like work for the garbage can. I mean, they, they never saw the, the life uh, yeah. of, of users. So you, Th this was also, and nowadays, just like you, you build something in two weeks that you just can show to users, that you can just get feedback immediately. Um, I think that's getting much better than what we have done in the past. Mm -hmm. I think we have some. Um, I'm very, very sorry to interrupt you, but um, we have a problem with Slido. Uh, it's unfortunately not working right now, so we will have to do it the manual way. If the audience has some questions, please uh, raise your hand. We have here people with the microphone who will just come to you and ask the questions like this. I'm very sorry, but we just need to manage it this, this emergency. So uh, let's do it manually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. No, this, this is cool. We've been using Slido and Zoom for two years. Yeah. It's just nice having an audience you can see. If you've got questions, just wave, yeah. raise your hand. You yeah. know. Nobody's on mute, it's gonna be fine. I, I can imagine what's <laughs> happening in the war room of Lido team right now, like, hey, we have thousand events going on and nothing works. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that's actually an interesting example. So Slido is a, it's a cloud platform that works very well most of the time, but when it stops working, there's nothing that we here can do about it because it's just down for everybody. And so there's one kind of school of thought which says, well, any conference should have its own online question and answer system so that we don't have to rely on the cloud. And then you're like, really? You want to hire developers to do that? Imagine what that's going to do to the ticket price and stuff. And that's the tension, is always, you know, how much money are you prepared to spend on owning all of the code for your own solution so that if it does go wrong, at least you're in a position to, to fix it. Um, but now, now we're in a comfortable position of sitting back and just waiting when the Slido comes back. And if, yeah. you, if you have built your business on top of something like Slido and have like, uh, business critical process flows going through that, then uh, it's maybe not the best or wisest idea to, to put everything 
on, on a startup, on, on a business that doesn't serve business critical features. It's just a yeah. Q&A platform. Well, I think uh, concurrent thousand of centers who use Slido right now are in a huge pile of uh, embarrassment and their credibility gets undermined. So that definitely has an impact to society as the, right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we're good at least because we have the in-house audience here. So we can do the old, old fashioned way, right? Just raise the hand, right? So it has become more complex to be a developer. Um, so it, it, the platform has become wider. I, I, I don't know about that. But where does it go in the future? Does, it, does this trend continue? I have a hypothesis. You have? Yeah, nice. I think actually developers have gone stupid because so much work is done for them. That's I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't <laughs> have a common mind on the complete stack, right? I mean, <laughs> because a lot of things, you know, from infrastructure, computers, memory, whatnot, everything is done for yeah. them. So you're saying it's becoming a copy-paste culture? I'm not saying that, but uh, <laughs> when I hear your views, are we more stu stupid because our work is automated? See, I, uh, I, I don't like the use of the word stupid. Yeah, I think maybe. efficient is maybe a better word. Right. Or certainly, a, you know, a, a sort of more, more comfortable word. Um, there is, I think it is possible now to deliver something that has value uh, with less knowledge of the technical domain and it takes less yes. time. You don't need to know so much about the hardware. You know, I'm, I'm from the, the school, we have this phrase full stack developer. And to me, a full stack developer is still somebody who can physically make network cable at one end and they can design buttons in Photoshop at the other end and they can do everything in between those two. But at some point, the, I think mainly the JavaScript community went, oh no, 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 full stack just means you run JavaScript on the client and the server. And I think we lost a kind of useful shorthand for a certain kind of developer. Um, but you don't need to do that anymore. You know, if you're prepared to say, look, I don't need designs, I have bootstrap, bang, done, there. Now it looks good. I don't need to worry about it. Um, I don't really need a back end. I'm just going to pour everything into a, you know, document database so I never need to design a schema. And it works. You know, you can build applications that solve a problem. And I think the biggest um, kind of gap is businesses understanding how long is this going to run for before it blows up in our face? Mm. You know, is this going to get us to the end of the week, or should we be putting this into our five-year plan? So there I, is an expiry date on each release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's an idea that I think software, we've always, and this is our own fault, we went around in the 80s and the 90s going, look, we can automate your entire company. And then you can fire everybody and run your whole operation by just pushing this button. And we never told them, oh, yeah, you'll need to get us back next week to change the button, and the week after that, and the week after that, and the week after that. And you know, the notion of expiry dates and software just you know, um, going off, requiring active maintenance is still, why are we still paying people to run the software? You told us it was finished. And it's like, well, no, it's not really ever finished. Uh, and that's maybe something where it's about bridging that, that gap in understanding. What, what do you think, Sven? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just getting reminded of um, that it has actually always been that way because I, I have heard people saying, you know, my son can build that on a weekend, um, just like by his PHP knowledge. And it, you just like say, oh, what the? Yeah, you can, of course, put something fast together. And maybe this is also just like what we have right now because we have all the services at our fingertips, right? Uh, we can just like machine, machine learning algorithms, just throw them in into the mix. Um, everything is there on AWS. You need a time series database, grab it. Um, that makes it for the first maybe looks very simple to build something. But as you said, like making it sustainable, making it scalable over time. Um, that is something where we, you really need software engineers to think things through and to design it from the start up. Like, know what you want to have in mind. Maybe you, you have a service that just lives there for three or four weeks. Fine, just like throw it together. Don't think about scalability or anything. But if you know you want to build your business on that, make it, make it more sustainable. So um, it's easy to build a, a web page with a cat image like you showed at oh your yeah. keynote. But going a step further, that's it's just very hard to sell it. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I was just thinking, like, does it, what does it mean for, you, you know, we're talking about different specializations, it feels like, because the developers, they can't know everything. The full stack is too big now, if we compare it to what you were describing, right? So the full stack gets smaller. Do, do we need more 
specialized developers, what does it mean? Does it mean that the, the developer work is getting more boring, more into silos of different types of developers, or what does it actually mean like, I, I in the future? I would actually challenge you uh, on the, if you don't fight complexity, it will grow. Mm. Yeah. Clear, right? Entropy, basically. Yeah. So, but do, do we if have you to are a full-stack developer and... in the company, then limit, make it simpler, make mm -hmm. it leaner, cleaner, you know, frame, make decisions what you use. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you are well-functioning full-stack developer but in that frame. Deep, that's so complex. Oh, well, uh, it <laughs> probably execution of it is pretty complex, yeah? yeah. Yeah, and I also think it becomes also a people problem, right? Maybe you have mm. someone who is interested in this and someone... You need to build some a, a team around a, a, your, your product, right? And it no, needs to be cross-functional because there are so many different disciplines in there, um, like IT, security, design, um, and they all need to work together to build this beautiful product that you want to build. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are probably people that are, feel more comfortable in, in doing one thing than the other thing. Um, at the end, everything just needs to lead to this to this product that you want to build, and everyone needs to understand what you want to build to just like in concert build the stuff. So, um, to, so you need these different disciplines and the different kind of developers or um, designers or whatever you need for for building the product inside your team to build the right stuff. Mm -hmm. So, in in my mind, it essentially boils down to the. Uh, inner motivation or inner burning of these developers to actually build that specific product they're working on. Because in the past, uh, it, it feels to me that technology itself was uh, so interesting, so engaging, that it was sufficient. I, I didn't uh, need to have a certain kind of business understanding for what it was for. It was uh, sufficient for me to build something big that was used by so many end users and now it's, it's become something entirely different. We need, to, we need some purpose. We, we don't yeah. just want to build so, another stack of microservices. Yeah, I was about to raise the point of like, creativity from a developer's perspective. Like, let's say in the 90s, where you were more closer to hardware, you had to find solutions to combat these memory limitations, for example, right? So you have, you're presented in a, with a problem, and you find to, have to find creative ways to overcome those, right? But now the creative solutions are in other places, I guess. So that, that's also something, I guess, that might change in the future. Like, you have to be interested in what you're doing, right? Then you're getting motivated, and then you want to be a developer. But what is it that will make future developers want to be developers? And there's something that I've, I've thought many times, and I've said to many people, is that I think you want three things in uh, your job or your career, whatever you do, is you want technology that's interesting in its own right. You want problems that are worth solving, and you need to be kind of getting paid enough that you're not worrying about the money. And that way, on a really good day, then you have all three of those things firing for you. You're interested in the tech, you're interested in the problem, and you feel like you're getting you know, good rewards for your work. And then you know, maybe one day one of those things isn't right, and you're like, you know what, I'm not actually enjoying working with dynamic CRM very much, but I still think the problem is important. So I care about building a good system for the people. Other days you're gonna be like, you know what, the people can go to hell, I don't care. But hey, this is actually still pretty good and they are paying me. And if you get to a point where you only have one of those things left, that's the point where you start looking around and going, I don't care about the tech or the people, I'm only doing this for the money or I'm not getting paid enough and the technology sucks, but I like the people. Because then you're kind of one thing away from burnout from not caring at all about what you do anymore. On and, the edge. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's just once in a while, just checking, like, how many of these boxes am I ticking with the work I do right now? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I'm as guilty as anybody mm -hmm. at various points in my career. Somebody has come to me and said, could you build us a, I don't know, build us a login system? Because no one ever built a login system before. And I've been like, yeah. If you pay me, I'll build, and boom, you know, I build a login system. And I'm thinking I can fix everything that I hate about every login system I've ever used. It's gonna be the best login system. But you know how many times I've done that? It's gotta be like five or six, just me. And you know, that's, it's reinventing the wheel. It's maybe kind of, you know, there's a couple of specific details that would make it a little bit more complicated to just integrate something, but it's fun. 
And it's also, uh, it is fun solving a problem that you, or building a solution to a problem that you understand well. Because I think that's where the, the, the element of craft comes into it. And you're taking pride in, okay, I'm going to take all the mistakes that I made last time, I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to make it better. And that's a very kind of tempting and attractive thing. But I think the net result is there's 200 million billion login systems out there in the world. And every day someone's like, can you build us a login system? And a bunch of developers are like, yeah. We'd love to do that. Um, and you know, what else could we all be building instead of reinventing password reset email again? Yeah, so. been there a lot of times. Like, yeah. We have reinvent the wheel and then we have to maintain it. That's the worst thing. Like I build it and it's just like this two weeks project and we build it in house and don't use the library for it. But like, and then you have to maintain it and that's becoming a, a full person job all of a sudden or full team's job to maintain your, your in house technology that you actually easily could have bought somewhere, but mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, thanks Dylan, this uh, three pillar thing is actually really, for me at least, something to take away with because it uh, makes it very clear yeah. where the motivation comes from. Look at the audience, you'll see a couple of people out there going, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. really? Sorry. <laughs> I think like, building a login system is like adopting a puppy. It's, uh, it's fun to do that. <laughs> no, it's like adopting a baby crocodile. They're really cute when they're this big. And then it's up this and the police have questions and you're like, I didn't yes. realize. Yes, so. maybe. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a better comparison. So another thing that's happened over the past years is uh, the trend of becoming more remote first everything. So, uh, Sven, you have looked into like team culture and uh, team setup a lot and talked about this a lot. And today you, you spoke about uh, becoming a more effective developer. Um, how do you put remote first in this mix? As, as you didn't mention it at all, uh, how, how it can influence the effectiveness of being a developer? I mean, the last two years have shown that pretty much we can run everything remotely. Um, there's some, some human implications there um, that I think like we have to, now that we're coming out of this time where we, need, we needed to work remotely, need to look at again and just like, how do we do this human interactions? Because we basically we all just like felt that we were missing this, right? We, we were missing this uh, in, the, in the setup and Zoom calls can't, can't give, us, give us this back. But I've been working remotely for I don't know, 12 years now uh, without a, a team that I have, uh, and it is working with the right, right screws that you that you need to s set up. Um, and I mean, I could talk for hours about remote work, um, but I think we can't, we, we cannot, we cannot just like turn it back. I mean, mm -hmm. um, we, we, so at Manfred, we we are, we are uh, actually looking for. Uh, so developers can find the dream jobs, um, so they have to register. And, and we're looking for, for, for jobs for people. And 90% of the people want to work remotely. We, we really have, if, if a company comes to us and says, says, find us a developer in Barcelona or wherever, we really have problems finding, finding people that want to come to an office. Um, we always advise that, yeah, maybe you should just like, do just like one, day, one office day or something, because we have problems finding finding people. So remote is not going away. Just just saying that it's going to stay. Um, could, could you maybe give, uh, let's say, three short tips to our listeners uh, as as developers or as uh, company or startup owners, how to make remote first effective? Um, as first, just like try to try to also meet in person. Um, there's a lot of social aspect there when you meet in person that you can't reproduce in Zoom calls. So spend money. Um, I, I just can, can say, for example, the Trello team is, was always a fully remote team. Um, and they actually had this event once a year where they brought all the people together. They called it Trello Together. Um, and they're still doing this. Um, to bring the people together in one place not to work, not to talk about strategy, but just to socialize. Um, just to get to know each other better helps you also on your work in, in person, helps you also on the work level to work better together. So um, this is one thing. Um, hybrid teams, I'm a little bit like, this is, this is hard. If people are in the office, say five people are in the office, two people are remote, or the other way around, 
it's just like hard because there's office conversation going on and you want to avoid this. Team calls, five people sitting in a room, um, two people remote is like awful, awful setup. We all know that. So avoid that. Just like go, go, go fully remote. Let people go to the office if they want, but let's like run it as a, as a remote, remote team. This is actually what I, what I saw with uh, even, even before we had the lockdowns and then the remote first trends. If we had uh, teams in multiple locations, it's better to have two autonomous teams in different locations rather than just have one team and then some uh, augmented addition in the other location because there was a communication disruption between these uh, two parts of the team. But if there were two autonomous teams, they were able to work autonomously and independently. Yeah, yeah. Before the pandemic, actually, at Atlassian, there was just like one, one rule that either a team has to be fully remote or fully an office team. Now, everything is remote first, also at Atlassian, but before they just like make the decision to just like say, you can be on an office team, but then you have to go to the office, or you can be on a remote team, but then everything is remote. Um, that was just like these two choices. They didn't want to build hybrid teams. Yeah, and regarding the first tip, I think uh, you had an example before. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just thinking about the setup that, that we have in, in my team in, in Pipedrive, right? So, well, we have actually, we have both of the things that you basically said, no, no, no. <laughs> so we... <laughs> you have the experience. Uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're running a team where we have people both in Prague and Tallinn, right? So that's cross-location already. Uh, but I think that um, at the beginning of last, last year, or now two years ago, it's yep. now two years two ago. Two years. Jeez. <laughs> so, so at that time, I, th I think these teams learned to work better together as well, because you, everybody had to go home anyways, right? So then uh, these cross-location yeah. meetings also started to be remote first meetings. But, but then now that it's seized up, as you say, you can go to the office, but essentially the cross-location team is also a remote uh, first team. So I think there's like something that we had to just try out and see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's worked for us, and, and the, I think the binding factor for us is like the passion in the area that we're working on. So every morning we have stand-ups uh, in Zoom first, obviously, always. Uh, all the people are attending, so they can share experiences. It's a little bit longer stand-up than you would have an on-site, because then usually they say, you know, don't talk too much. Investment needs to be bigger. Yes. But I actually like the, the other example you had, that uh, the event budget for a team yeah. that doesn't have an office is bigger, because now you can save on the cost yes. of an office, but uh, yeah. so you need to have a bigger event budget so that these people can actually come together and, and mingle. Yeah, so th this, is, this happened in our uh, Lisbon office where the office was closed uh, during pandemic and all the Lisbon people were remote first, essentially, right? But then you have all the office maintenance budget that can go into team building, which is, which is actually could be comparable. Uh, yeah, I was thinking to drill down into async co collaboration, basically, so I mean, we, we all used to some rituals, routines, when we were in offices, maybe some people were remote, somebody was in another office. We sort of accommodated, we got into a sort of a comfort zone with, with collaboration. And now, boom, everyone are remote. And we, I think, well, that, at least what I've seen is that it's really hard for people to accept and uh, sort of uh, recognize that a lot of work it be, is becoming asynchronous. Mm -hmm. uh, where? <laughs> so is this the next thing of uh, now we're talking about remote first, like everybody has to be on the meeting, we're going to do stand up at this time, everybody be here, but is the async, asynchronous communication style maybe a next, uh, next way of working? Well, so let's just everybody write in this chat whenever we get the chance what we are doing today and tomorrow. There's an interesting <laughs> synergy. There are um, there's Moore's law, which is, you know, processor speed doubles every 18 months. And uh, we kind of, we hit a plateau with Moore's law about 10 years ago, where the only way to get faster was parallel. You had to run multiple cores because you couldn't get more cycles out of it. So Moore's law basically hit a point where it's like, we got to be able to parallelize the workload. And uh, Amdahl's law, uh, Gene Amdahl was a chip designer at Intel, and he came up with this law about you can't parallelize work with monolithic workloads in it. 
You've got to be able to break it down into little distributed asynchronous tasks. And then Conway's law comes along and says, well, your software is going to reflect the structure of your team. So if your software is going to have distributed asynchronous workloads, you need a distributed asynchronous team. And so, you know, it almost you can prove from first principles that the most efficient way of developing modern software is to have a lot of people. They're all distributed. They work when they're available. And uh, you know the work items, the work that needs to be done should always be captured somewhere in a way that whoever needs to, they can pick it up, they can work on it, and they can put it back without needing lots of people to keep having meetings to get everyone up to date. Mm. Now, that's difficult. You know, It's difficult building software that works effectively that way. It's even harder building teams that work effectively that way. Um, but if you get it right, you know, I think that eliminates an awful lot of the, the challenges around things like uh, remote first. We have a question. We have a raised hand at the back. Yeah, Dylan, uh, uh, just before that question, I, I think it's, uh, it's like winning in, uh, with a lottery. So it's like if you get it right, you're going to be really <laughs> happy. <laughs> but, but it's really difficult to get it right, right? Yeah. To get those numbers. So uh, let's. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. It was really interesting to hear about the base principles, but uh, what immediately popped into my mind was uh, in agile uh, uh, workloads, uh, what happens really often is that you have to iterate uh, multiple t times during a day with your ideas. And uh, as a developer, it means that uh, more often than less often, you have to actually uh, get in contact with your product owner or whoever or not, who can actually give feedback on those thought iterations. So if we are working in an asynchronous way, uh, how should we try to facilitate for these kinds of uh, fast iterations then? Because I see that there is a kind of a scissor here that in one, way, in, uh, uh, one regard, yes, uh, asynchronous working is the future, but on the other hand, it seems to kind of hinder the fast iterations as well. So I think the, in a nutshell, the important question is how do you collaborate without it being a meeting? Because the perception is that meetings are where everyone stops working and they all have a meeting. And that's the stuff where you need everyone to be on Zoom at the same time or you need everyone in the office at the same time. And you know, I think there's a reasonable expectation that if people are working together on something on a given day, then they're available and they're communicating. But that communication should not be a blocking exclusive activity that means you have to make all the decisions now and then you have to go away and implement the decisions, and then you're like, oh, we didn't decide this, and then you need to stop work and go back and do that again. Um, and again, you know, that's, I think, your, your point about when uh, social activity, that means you know people. It means you've got a sort of better understanding of their character and your working relationship, which is very difficult to establish purely you know, online and remote. A lot of the people I know who've really struggled onboarding are like, we had 100 people and then we hired another 20 during the pandemic who've never met any of their teammates in person. And it's like, you know, you get almost like an us and them mentality. There's the people who know each other and then there's the newbies who they've only met online. But I think once you have that, uh, you know, part of it is about a mutual respect. It's about good people acknowledging each other's strengths. And, you know, how immediately do you need feedback? Can you push something, put up a Slack going, hey, take a look at this, and then you know, take 15 minutes. Walk around the block, get a cup of coffee, you know, play with the dog, and then come back. OK, cool. And if you need to, you can just jump on a call or do a screen share, those kinds of things. Uh, I think it's just it's understanding that this whole spectrum of collaboration styles exists, from the all-company meeting where everyone is in the same room all day, through to just people dropping comments on, you know, look at the way open source on GitHub works. Um, you know, most open source projects do an awful lot of shipping without really having very many meetings. But they still figure things out and they still get stuff done. They just do it in a way that has a very different cadence to, uh, to I think, what managers expect out of stuff that they're paying. And maybe that's another issue where there's a lot of uh, opportunity to yeah. kind of re-examine some of this stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's great that you actually mentioned this open sourcing stuff because uh, a few years back uh, at a conference, I was sort of like enlightened by the topic of inner sourcing, right? So that's bringing the open source principles into a company internally, right? And actually this year we're, we're trying to actually 
uh, adopt some of these principles to make it work. Um, well, we have now like what two, 200 plus engineers, different kind of teams. Uh, so between teams, there's always a, a overlap of work as well, right? And, and some sharing. So what we're trying to do is adopting those principles so that they, we're not blockers for other teams rather than, you know, trying to make these open source things work that they, if they need to, they can contribute. We uh, encourage this. Uh, we, we can do all sorts, of co all sorts of collaboration, but it ha doesn't have to be super strictly synchronous, right? Uh, so I think there's, there, there's some, some ways to take away from that as well, because um, the, the bigger we grow, the more autonomous the teams have to become as well. And how do these big autonomous teams synchronize if yeah. they're even in different locations of the world, right? It has to become async, right? Yeah, I feel, I feel like um, work can be asynchronously. Uh, we, we can make it happen. We can just like, we need to work on it to just like make it happen. The social aspect can't be. Yes. Um, we need to just like brainstorm together. We need to just like meet together and just like tell our stories of the day, what happened, frustration, mm. blah, blah, blah. Um, this can't be asynchronously, but, but I think the, uh, the, the work that we need, we, we can work on this. Um, there are so many possibilities, uh, yeah. technology that can help us. We need to make it as synchronous as possible so people can also jump into their zone and don't get interrupted. We, I mean, even in the office, we hated it when people came into our office and just like tapped on our shoulders oh, and said, going. hey, yep. and then you're just like, oh, I was just like into something. Um, and and when no, no matter what, if it's remote or in the office, yeah. it's like, we need to work on this. And then when you really need to solve some hard problems, the boss says, right, come on, everyone, we're getting out of the office for the day. <laughs> it's like, you pay for all this real estate, but actually when we have difficult problems, we go somewhere else. Really? Um, there's one interesting idea I just wanted to add, talking about you know, uh, teams being asynchronous and autonomous and stuff, which is, uh, we are talking earlier about what do we expect developers to know? And the one thing that you know, I wish everybody working in technology understood on some level was the idea of you know, user experience design and what is it like for someone trying to use your solution? Because you know, there's a lot of thinking in tech is like, well, we have a UX team, and they design the product and make sure that it's easy for customers to use. But then you've got all these other silos of expertise. You've got the, you know, the designers, you've got security, you've got infrastructure. And you know, if those areas of expertise were like, well, actually, we want to turn our expertise into a product. You know, the, the best example is this is the difference between you've got some front-end developers who they need to make up a new page or a new form, and they need to know what it looks like. And in the old school thing, what they do is they go to the designer and they're like, hey, can you design us this form? And the designer goes, yeah, give me a couple of days and Photoshop and Figma and InDesign or whatever. And then they're like, right, here's the design. And then they're like, okay, now we can go and build it. Um, but you kind of take a, a step more mature than that. You have a design system. So the designers have said, these are our standard components and this is how you plug them in. And uh, you, know, you want to look at how big engineering organizations, you know, Facebook, Google, those kind of, how they maintain visual consistency across all of their products. Um, they don't have one person pushing Photoshop really, really hard, or even a team. They have a design system, which is a product, like the, you know, the inner source thing. It's something you need to, a button, you go and get the button from the button repository, and that's it. You use that as if it's a product. And uh, you know, security libraries, people provisioning internal infrastructure. You want to spin up a prototype or a test server. Do you need to file a ticket and wait, or is that something that you can just go ahead and do? And I think once you start thinking in terms of preemptively unblocking people before they get to the point where they'd have to ask for something, that can free up a lot of asynchronous so collaboration. This is essentially using technology to decouple teams. Yeah. So you take yeah. a design team and you decouple the rest of the teams by figuring out the design system so that other yeah. development or engineering teams can, can figure it out themselves. They're not coupled to that, engineering, uh, that design team anymore and design team can take uh, these things to the yeah. next level. Which makes software development even more complex again. <laughs> because, I mean, we need to understand design too. And it's like not just placing a button somewhere often the time. Yes. We need some, some more stuff around it. And that puts more stuff on the, which, which I'm saying is fine. It's great. And we should, yeah. should do that because we need to understand more than just like writing lines of code. Um, as, as I said before, we need to understand the problem too. Um, but yeah, it, it makes it a little, a little bit 
more complicated. Because it's definitely not transparent throughout these different uh, types of teams, let's put it this way, because that's sort of what we have, is we have a, a team, our team is doing the design system and working closely with designers, but the product teams, they're working with UX designers. So here's like the separation, visual design and the UX design, and yeah. they can use those libraries to build a better business product, which we don't want to do. We want to do the technical bits and the visual consistency bits, right? One of my favorite uh, development platforms ever was Windows Forms in .NET because, you know, you could do great user experience with WinForms, but you never had a meeting about what color the button was going to be. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> because the button is yeah. gray, because yeah. that's the button. And that, you know, that, that's the difference between visual design and UI. And, you know, a sufficiently mature design system, you don't even have that conversation. And if your company's decided that they don't want the buttons to be gray, well, you know, can they give you something that is that easy to use that you're just like, I need the button, I know where it goes, I know what it says, I don't care what it looks like, I'll just use yep. the standard one. Recently, you know. there was a, a quite good meme about uh, Steam's uh, lack of design system. Like, each of their buttons looks different <laughs> for some strange reason. Uh, uh, did we have a question back there again? Yes, it's me again. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> so, um, I heard uh, multiple really interesting topics going through, like, briefly, uh, such as, uh, like, uh, separating concerns, uh, bringing IT probably closer to business, uh, diminishing uh, skill sets of developers, etc., etc. So, uh, according to my knowledge, as long as there has been uh, corporate IT, there has been an attempt to uh, bring development closer to business, uh, which has led to multiple attempts of uh, creating languages that the business users can actually use themselves, uh, and uh, also creating development tools that are completely alien to developers because uh, their or original intention was to be used by business users. Uh, so one of the more recent uh, developments in that uh, field has been uh, AI-generated code, uh, mm -hmm. where basically a developer just gives a hint to the machine what uh, needs to be achieved, and the machine generates code for that. Uh, so it seems kind of like uh, futuristic today still, but uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, is actually this kind of uh, business merging with IT and uh, maybe future developers being uh, from business completely even possible? So will AI generate a lot of simple code and the hard tasks are given to developers in future? So uh, let me start with the thing that I think is, is a definite net positive, is effective code reuse. I've seen so much code in my life that somebody wrote because they didn't know that we already had that solution. You know, within, even within single projects where I've had two developers have implemented the same thing, and of course, you know, with open source, that's even bigger, and something like, uh, you know, GitHub Copilot or AI systems, I think they can definitely solve the problem of, hey, did you know this already exists? And that's good, you know, that's really good. I think then what we need to do is to encourage developers to be more critical of, and you know, this is not necessarily about pulling in packages. I like the idea that it sketches the code for you instead of pulling in a package. Um, you know, because there's a, this sort of tension in software. I need to do JPEG compression. All right, well, there's this, this package on NuGet or NPM uh, that does JPEG, PNG, bitmap, TIFF, SVG. It's 150 megabytes of code. I need one feature from one library, but I'll install the whole thing, and then suddenly there's a vulnerability you didn't know about in the PDF renderer. Um, and you know, I, I like the idea that the code you ship to production, you've actually seen what the code is, but maybe you didn't have to write it, or certainly you didn't have to design it. And so, you know, I think Copilot going, look, hey, this is an LZW decoder. Uh, take a look at this, figure out how it works, but at least you didn't have to write it yourself. And, you know, I think that, coupled with the reasonably rigorous testing strategy, is a perfectly good way to write code and ship it. Certainly, it's not any worse than what we're doing already. Um, I think the difficulty is uh, you aren't gonna, people aren't going to notice bugs. And there's, uh, there's this uh, implicit canary check built in there mm. that, uh, Sven, you mentioned before that the developer needs to read it and do I understand this? It, it cannot be so cryptic that mm -hmm. it, it might work, but nobody can understand it. It yeah. has to be understandable. I'll tell you what would be interesting, would be a version of Copilot that introduces one bug. 
<laughs> so it gives you almost the right code, but then you just need to fix it. <laughs> like, and if you can't fix it, you're not smart enough to use it. <laughs> Find the wall, though. Find <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, here is 800 lines of code, and I've put a semicolon in the wrong place. <laughs> and when you find the semicolon, then you're allowed to use the code. <laughs> so I find doesn't it doesn't work with HTML, yeah. of course. Cause I find it tempting to just like let the machine write the code uh, and just like throw, throw my business logic or problems into the machine and let them let the machine write the code. But I'm, I'm, I also had the slide of the grumpy developer uh, in, my, in my slide deck, and I'm maybe a little bit grumpy because actually I, my, my, one of my first job interviews, there was a company that was just like, oh, we have this building blocks, and you, the people don't have to write software, and they just put together these building blocks, and then the software gets generated automatically. Uh, and that's 25 years ago. Uh, and I think we figured out that doesn't work. Um, also, just like putting blocks, UML diagrams, translating it directly <laughs> to code. We all have been through this. It, it didn't work. I, I mean, I'm curious to see where this ends, but I'm a little bit like on the grumpy developer side that says, oh, seen that, done that, um, maybe. But today I had an uh, interesting discussion, uh, kind of raising a question, would it, for, would it work in the beginning? Like if we, we are starting up, we just want to validate our business idea. Can we just then use these drag and drop tools to figure something out? I mean, low code, no code stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can do, you can sail pretty far, you know, <laughs> with this stuff. But it's important to understand that once once you get big, then you need to rebuild everything because if this thing just and it's easy scale. to rebuild because it's spec is written already. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but coming coming back to the my son can build it on a weekend. Why yeah. did it take a month for you? Right? The, the the same thing has been there for a while, right? But it, it's 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 a bit difficult for developers and especially business owners to understand that you have to be ready to rebuild or rewrite your stuff, and this is how you it's effective developing, in my opinion. And you can totally mess up that as well. I mean, you the, can, the obviously. issue just. <laughs> that the Oracle Java had, they, yeah. they, it was an implementation that existed and they rewrote it in Java and they made a bug by doing that, just yeah. by missing one, uh, one expression, one condition that was in the original implementation. For some reason, they didn't add it. They just yeah. thought, ah, no need. Mm. That's the bug. So mm. <laughs> I guess here's where we can see like the big success stories when they evolve into the next stage at the right time. The timing is really important, right? If you do it too early, you're wasting too much effort into building something that already exists. If you do it too late, then you're gonna have a huge backlog of like uh, things to migrate, fix, and re-implement, right? So the timing is actually pretty key here, but like. Who's to say? Like, where where do you get that part? Like, it's, that's there was a, a at some point I, I encountered a business strategy generator online <laughs> that you just enter <laughs> words. Maybe you need some yeah. timing generator. Is Maybe, the time yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. the time right? Something in monitors. Are you, all right. You're nearing fifty thousand lines of code in a single repository. Maybe it's time to get a new arc. I was more thinking like about that. random, but <laughs> <laughs> guys, I want to open a, sort of a one one more chapter for you here. So, for some reason, some people think that they can't be software developers. Did you say they can or they can't? They can't be. Okay. For whatever reason, and probably there are reasons why most people can't be software developers. Do we have more software developers in, in future as a demographic group of the population? I think it is, uh, and I realize I'm saying this from a panel full of European white men, um, <laughs> the craft of software development has very much been defined by the people who decided that they wanted that to be the thing they were good at. And so, uh, you know, user experience design, oh no, that's not real programming. HTML, that's not real programming. And it's always like there was this little clique of people who were like, no, the thing we're good at is real programming and, and no one else is allowed to play. And you're like, well, no, those are every bit as important when it comes to building secure, usable, you know, systems that people actually want to, to download and install and play around with. Um, but they sort of defined it as, oh no, programming is this thing that some people can't do. 
And I'd love to think the solution to this is, well, let's take down the barriers and be like, you know what, we develop software. Anybody who contributes to uh, creating digital products that solve problems is part of that, you know, the, the, the tech industry. I like the, the shift away from software and more kind of the word tech being applied to the, the collaborations that go on here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I genuinely believe that anyone can be a software developer. I think what maybe sets certain people apart is a sort of bloody-minded willingness to sit there staring at error messages until 3 o'clock in the morning. And then finally, they're like, OK, it clicks now. Oh, yeah, suddenly I understand pointer arithmetic. Suddenly I understand memory allocation. Suddenly I understand null terminated strings. And uh, you know, it's not that that's necessarily difficult. It's just some people would be like, why are you still doing that? <laughs> like, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Go to bed. And uh, certainly, you know, I, I put myself in that category of, of being tenacious and bloody-minded enough to, to keep kicking away at it. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a required part of the process anymore. Um, I think certainly now that, you know, stuff's online, we've got Stack Overflow, we've got open source repos on GitHub, we've got Copilot. Uh, you don't need to sit there until 4 o'clock in the morning trying to figure it out for yourself. And I think that that, you know, one, let's, let's cast the net wider and say, no, no, we are developing software collaboratively, um, you know, right across the spectrum. But two, the task of uh, learning how to write code has become more accessible, and I think we need to keep pushing that so that everyone has the sh opportunity to try it out and be like, do I want to do this? Actually, yeah, this is good. I like this. Let's do more of this. Uh, Sven, what do you think? <laughs> like building stuff smarter. Yeah. That's exactly what Sven is talking about, right? Um, yeah, I, I also think like we need, I mean, definitely we will have more software developers. We need more software developers. People will come into this industry, but also, yeah, as we said, we need to open up also. Um, it, it shouldn't be that geeky, nerdy thing um, that shies, shies people away. Um, and we need, to, we need to open up. I just heard a podcast about like a developer experience podcast, and then there was some interview, uh, and they said, yeah, we need to make it a little bit hard to adopt this technology because software developers want the challenge in there. And I think like, oh, that's, we shouldn't do that because like, then we just like have our own stereotypes and we're just like building the same stuff. And that's it's, the, it's exactly a closed, this closed thing environment. That Dylan said that it's, it's building kind of language for the people you expect to be there, mm. but you, uh, instead you should widen the audience. Yeah. Because, I mean, we, when we look at history, right, we, we took a bunch of people from the fields to the factories to use not the muscles, the big muscles, to the small muscles. Now we took those people from the factories that didn't, didn't have to use muscles anymore, maybe finger muscles and their brain muscle, right? Yeah. So, I mean, these transformations have happened. So I would imagine Right now, as an office worker, I create documentation and communication. That's all I do, basically. Two things. Uh, why not me creating services? But why not? As documents. But it's, could it be that in the future, we're talking about the AI and co-piloting and all of that stuff, uh, what defines a developer is the ability to translate or business requirements and put it in just an algorithm, which is what development is, right? It, instructions for software to do something right and if you're able to actually describe it understand one and translate it to, to the other language maybe then you are a developer uh, I, I think Dylan you have tried to um, I can't say lower the barrier but change the barrier by uh, writing the rockstar programming language <laughs> so that the people who, who are maybe creative in that way can enter the I think there Arena is a, development as well. So I, th I think there is enormous value in things which are clearly useless mm. as a learning tool. Stuff that, uh, so those of you who don't know it, Rockstar is a programming language where all of your programs are heavy metal songs. And uh, you can write programs, uh, programs that rhyme and you can actually sing them. I've done this at shows and things. Uh, and it's useless. You know, if anyone ever tried to run it in production, it doesn't even have I.O. You can redirect standard in and standard out, and that's it. Um, but it does allow you to understand how you build a, uh, a parser, how you do a parsing expression grammar, flow control, exception handling, 
And, you know, I, it, and it's fun. Lots and lots of people. I've been really surprised at the number of people who they find it and they're like, this is so cool. And they stay up all night figuring out how to make it work. And, uh, you know, it's like lowering the barrier. I think the barrier was maybe pretty low. What, I, what I'd like to think I've done is I've given people with a certain kind of creative mind something that feels like a way in for them to start playing around with technology and be like, this is not actually as complicated as it looks. Exactly, creating another and, doorway. Yeah. For... Um, and I think the more of those that we have, the better. You know, let's, let's make the, the industry as accessible and as inclusive as we can by every time we see an opportunity. Hey, how do we get those people interested in uh, learning a little bit more about how to make technology work for them? So, uh, but yeah, that, that's a lot of fun. Yes. And anyone comes to the party tonight, you might hear some rock stars. So. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, so uh, we're running out of time. Um, thank you, everybody here. Uh, thank you, everybody online. And thank you to our listeners next week. Uh, thank you to our guests. You have been awesome. It was a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much hope, for having us. Hope yeah, you pleasure. enjoyed it. Um, and uh, good luck with next shows. Good, not, good luck with being a developer in the future. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. Don't worry about it. They're well, just trying to scare you. Being a developer is going to be And all amazing. the future people get back to us, whether you became autopiloted auto developers or what happened. Yes, let us know what happened. Thanks. <laughs>